when we look at the flourishing of the wicked, at the unjust treatment of the righteous, at the seeming unfairness of it all, when our hearts might well long for a piece of the success and the prosperity of the wicked, when envy or anger threatens to rise within us, there are essentially two ways in which we might respond. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today we continue a message we began last time, Waiting for the Lord. And Jonathan, I think all of us have probably seen those who are, quote unquote, behaving badly, those who are not living godly lives. And it appears as if everything is going great for them, making money, seem to have uh, you know good families, all, all sorts of good things. And we can, I think, look at that and envy can begin to grow. And when that begins to happen, you said there are two ways we can respond to that. What are those two ways that we typically see? Well, we can let envy and bitterness fester in our hearts, or we can entrust ourselves to the Lord and wait on His promises and the fulfillment of His Word. I mean, those are the two things that we can do. And the Scriptures call those who know Christ, who trust in Christ, the, the Scripture calls believers simply to wait on the Lord and we're, we're helped to do that when we remember that the outcome of life is very, very different for those who trust in the Lord, who have found refuge in Him, and for those who reject the Lord and are living on their own terms. And the psalm we're looking at today, Psalm 37, reminds us of that very starkly in, in poetic language, but in language that's very, very helpful. It reminds us that wrongdoers will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Hmm. And it tells us there's a very different outcome for the believer. And we need to remember that, and we need to hold to it. Well, we're going to look at that, as you just heard, in Psalm 37. So grab a Bible and join us there as we continue our message, Waiting for the Lord. Here is Jonathan. The two profiles that David sets before us here in the psalm, they they couldn't be more different. They are actually diametrically opposed to one another. And I don't think there's actually anything too surprising within them. We know the profile of the wicked. We've seen enough versions of that type. But for the grace of God, we'd all be like that ourselves. We know something of the profile of the righteous as well. As Christian believers, we know that this is what we're called to be like. But now here's the issue, and I think it's the real heart issue of the psalm. Are there not days when we wonder whether it is actually worth being on the side of light rather than darkness? Are there not days when we wonder whether it would not just be easier and a bit more rewarding and a bit more satisfying just to live as the wicked live. The wicked give the righteous a hard time, and they seem often to flourish as they do so. The wicked seem to have more material wealth, more success, more acclaim, more worldly happiness in some ways sometimes. And so we ask ourselves, perhaps, even if very, very quietly and very, very discreetly, we ask ourselves, what's the point? I mean, what is the point? If you're not a Christian believer and you wonder if all this is actually for you, it's, it's actually a reasonable question on one level, but it is a vitally important one. Why buy in to all this when living the world's way is easier and seemingly more rewarding much of the time? A question, you see, it's relevant to all of us. And David anticipates it in the next contrast that he draws for us. If there are two types of people in this psalm, there are also two very distinct futures. The righteous and the wicked can anticipate two very different outcomes to their lives. Notice again how the psalm opens. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. The other day I was, I was studying in preparation for this sermon. I was in my study and I, I glanced out the window and as I did so, I caught sight of our lawn, which has not had a great summer, all things considered. I was actually aggrieved at the sight of the crabgrass that was beginning to take over the patch outside the window 
The heat of the summer had taken a toll on the grass, as it often does. The crabgrass had made the most of the opportunity to move in. As I sat there, I began to strategize, root out the crabgrass, irrigate the soil, reseed with proper grass. And then a comforting thought occurred to me. Crabgrass is, I understand, an annual weed. It will die over the winter, and there will be a fresh start in the spring. The crabgrass, it is dominant now. There's no question about that. You come around, you'll see it. But it's not going to have the final word. As we look out on the injustices of this present world, and we are tempted to vexation or despair, David draws our eyes to the further horizon of God's future. And he reminds us that how things appear now, the present order of things, it is not how they will be ultimately in the future. The wicked who seem to be flourishing now, the wicked, the ruthless man, verse 34, who is currently spreading like a green laurel tree, his future is going to be very, very different to his present. Such a person will, verse 2, fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Evildoers will, verse 9, be cut off. In just a little while, verse 10, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. In just a little while, it seems like a long time to us. But in God's economy, all this will come soon. The wicked may plot against the righteous in the present day, verse 12, and gnash his teeth at him. But here is God's perspective, knowing what he himself will do. Verse 13, the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. God will turn the weapons of the wicked upon themselves, verse 14. He shall break their arms, verse 17. The wicked will perish, verse 20. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Transgressors, verse 28, verse 38, rather, shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Each one of us, we've got to grapple with that vital question, that pressing question. Is it worth following the Lord Jesus Christ and living his way and pursuing righteousness day by day? I, I see the wicked having a pretty good time of it in this present world. There are possessions and experiences and indulgences that they are able to pursue, and they seem to be enjoying it pretty well. Why not join them? We might never articulate that question to anyone else in polite Christian circles. We might not admit that it has occurred to us in any way but the reality is that we all have to grapple with it. We have to grapple with it because the issue is so obvious before us. For some here, I suspect, some listening, that question will be weighing on your mind and your heart in a particular way at the moment, and you are struggling to put it aside. And when we start thinking along these lines, we need to remember the truth that David drives home in this psalm again and again. The wicked who may enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for a while in this world, they will face the destructive judgment of God in a time to come. The day of judgment is coming. God will address wickedness in a definitive way. And the awful prospect of hell looms before the enemies of God. And friends, that is a very compelling reason. Let me say it is the compelling reason not to join them. It's a compelling reason to keep our distance, to stay away. It's a compelling reason, but it's actually not the only reason. The future not only holds out a fearful prospect for the wicked, it also holds out a joyful prospect for the righteous. This is Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and glad you're listening today as we continue our message called Waiting for the Lord, part of our series, Songs of the Heart. And we'll get back to this look at Psalm 37 in just a moment. 
If you ever miss a broadcast, come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. That's also a great place to go. If you want to find out more about this ministry or support us financially, because we are truly listener-supported, it is your generosity that keeps Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book that Jonathan has picked out. It's written by Sinclair Ferguson, and it's called Worthy. It's all about living in light of the gospel. And again, this is our thank you gift to you for your financial support. You can give a gift online when you come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org, or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884, or EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here's Jonathan. The future not only holds out a fearful prospect for the wicked, it also holds out a joyful prospect for the righteous. I always love stories of great reversals where the underdog rises to great success. In most cases, in stories of the underdog rising to great success, you can't predict the reversal that might come. You can only sort of wonder at it in retrospect. In recent days, I've embarked upon reading Neil Ferguson's immense biography of Henry Kissinger, at least the first published volume of it, which actually runs to about a thousand pages, so I'll probably never finish it. But if you know the name Henry Kissinger, you will know that he stands as one of the most powerful and influential Americans of the last century. For many years, he was seen as perhaps the greatest power broker in Washington, advising multiple administrations and serving as Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. Now, what you may or may not know about Kissinger is that his birth name was Heinz, and he grew up in a Jewish family in Germany in the tumultuous years leading up to the Second World War. For the early part of his life, Kissinger was a not very remarkable student living in an industrial town of very marginal importance as part of a group facing increased pressure and ultimately violent persecution. His family, they had to flee Germany for the United States just to survive. But, you know, remarkably, as the story goes on, this young refugee of insignificant background, rose to be one of the most powerful and influential men in the world. It's quite a story. It's a a story of a stunning reversal, and one in prospect that I don't think anyone could have predicted. Here in Psalm 37, David asserts and insists that a great reversal is coming for the marginalized, sometimes persecuted, often overlooked people of God. A day is coming when things are going to look very different indeed. In the nearer term, there is the prospect of the Lord working out his good purposes in the lives of his people, and he will do that. He will bring blessing and help in this life. Notice it with me, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. As you walk with the Lord and and get to know him and delight yourself in him and in his word and just in who he is, he's going to bring your will into conformity with his will, your desires into conformity with his desires, and he's going to bring those desires about in your life and in mine. As you long for his will to be done and as you long to grow in godliness and be an effective servant of his, he's going to bring about those desires in increasing measure in this life, in the here and now. The righteous may face difficulty and trouble in this world, but those things, they they may challenge us, they may grieve us, but they won't destroy us. Verse 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, though he face terrible trouble, he shall not be cast headlong for the Lord upholds his hand. What a wonderful promise that is. There may be trouble that threatens even the ability of the righteous to find food and sustenance. There may be pressure and opposition that makes it very, very hard to survive, but David knows how the Lord cares for his people. Verse 25, that lovely observation again, I've been young, now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. 
in the days to come, in the nearer future within this life, the righteous person can count on the gracious care, the loving provision of God. But in the longer term, there is a glorious promise of total blessing and complete victory for the righteous. Verse 9, for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The Old Testament people of God longed for the promised land to be theirs with no challenge from the wicked. But as we look forward today, we have the greater promise, don't we, of the new heavens and the new earth, which will be ours to enjoy in the Lord's presence. And the wicked will have no part in that inheritance for the righteous. It will be a future of total peace without threat of any kind from anyone. Verse 28, for the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. There is a deliverance. There is a vindication. There is a glorious inheritance, a liberation, a peace in store for the people of God. It's coming. It will come. It cannot be thwarted or taken away. This is the future for those who know God through Jesus Christ. And in order for us to keep pursuing righteousness and not envying the wicked. In order to preserve us from joining the wicked, we need to keep this future in view all the time. I don't know about you, but for me, one of the greatest challenges of this present season with the coronavirus has been the challenge of really being unable to plan for the future or look forward to key things in the future. Most of the time, we live life, don't we, with some short-term or medium-term goals to look forward to. You know, in a couple of months, we're going to go on vacation. At the end of this course, I'm, I'm going to start a new job. In the next season, I'll, I'll go back to the sport that I, I love. In, in a few weeks, I'm going to see those family members who live in another city or another country. Whatever it is, we're always looking forward, aren't we? That's how we live our lives. And our, our hopes and our plans for the future, they have a way of kind of sustaining us for the present. I think you know what I mean. We all have a sense of that. We all have versions of that in our lives. But during the pandemic, so many of those things have just been taken away. We can't plan for very many of them with very much certainty. And the result has been that many have been really quite discouraged in this present time. Uh, we've been down in the dumps or worse. It's been tough for many to keep going. You know, as believers in Jesus Christ, we can only keep going in joy and in confidence walking with the Lord day by day, we can only keep going if we keep the prospect of this joyful and certain future before our eyes day by day. We need that, each one of us. It's actually a matter of spiritual survival. Two types of person, two types of future, and finally, as we close, two types of response. When we look at the flourishing of the wicked, at the unjust treatment of the righteous, at the seeming unfairness of it all, when our hearts might well long for a piece of the success and the prosperity of the wicked, when envy or anger threatens to rise within us, there are essentially two ways in which we might respond. One is to allow these feelings to fester and to grow within our hearts. It's the danger with which David begins the psalm, as you remember. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. David gives the warning because he knows the danger. He knows how easy it is to become with, consumed with anger or frustration because of the wicked and because of their behavior. He knows how easy it is to fret ourselves over the wicked person who is benefiting from doing evil at the expense of others. He knows how easy it is not only to feel frustrated or angry to the point of grinding your teeth and losing sleep at night, he knows how easy it is as well to envy them in what they're getting away with. And he says, don't go there. Uh, don't do that. Fret not yourself, middle of verse 7 over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. That person, they're not your 
problem. They're not your responsibility. His prosperity at the present time, it is not your concern. David knows that we can fret over these things and we can grow angry. And he knows that those feelings and reactions will take us to a very, very bad place, a dark place. Verse 8, refrain from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. Now that's, that's one response, and David warns us against it. He says, don't go there, don't do it. But there is another way, and David commends it to us again and again throughout the psalm. It, it is simply to entrust ourselves and to entrust the entire situation to the Lord, to allow him to work out his good purposes in his good time. Just notice it with me. It's actually the repeated and emphatic message of the entire psalm. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord and trust in him. Verse 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Verse 27, turn away from evil and do good. Verse 34, wait for the Lord and keep his way. Friends, a key part of the life of faith, a core element of the Christian life is this, and it's an element that we are slow to learn. We are slow to take hold of this. It is to entrust messy and difficult and grievous situations to the Lord and to believe that he will work things out in his way in perfect justice and in perfect fairness. It is to content ourselves with the situation in life that God has given us, not to allow ourselves to look at the wicked and to envy their lives. It is to wait for the blessing of God to rejoice in the future that he has set before us and to recognize that in the present there may be a challenge and there may be a difficulty. There may be a good deal of unfairness. I don't know what cause you might have today to fret yourself over the wicked. I don't know how evildoers may have harmed you. I don't know in what way their success or prosperity is tempting you toward envy. But I do know that the Lord sets two futures before us. He reminds us of the judgment of the wicked and the salvation of the righteous. And he calls you and he calls me to quietly trust him, to wait for him by the help of the Spirit to keep on keeping on pursuing righteousness and walking with him. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, our message, Waiting for the Lord, part of a larger series, Songs of the Heart. If you've missed any of the broadcasts in this series, you can always come to our website. You can listen to each and every one online. You can stream the program or download an MP3 at EncounterTheTruth.org. Encounter the Truth is listener-supported. It is your generosity that keeps Jonathan's teaching on the station, so thank you for giving to and supporting this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book Jonathan has picked out. It's called Worthy, Living in Light of the Gospel. And Jonathan, how is reading this book going to benefit us? Well, I hope it's going to impact your heart and your life. I hope it's going to feed your soul. The purpose of this book is simply to encourage us who know Jesus to live faithfully as his people, to allow the gospel to transform our way of life. And I I just find I need those encouragements. I need those helps. And, And I find it especially helpful if the book is readable and not too long. And this book, which is rich in content and thoughtful, it's written by seasoned theologian Sinclair Ferguson, who's always full of rich insight, but he's made it accessible. And it's designed, yes, to feed the mind, but to nourish the soul. And I believe it'll do that for you if you read it, and we'd love to get it to you. Well, a gift of any amount, and we're going to say thank you by sending you a copy of Worthy, Living in Light of the Gospel. You can call, give your gift, and request a copy. Our number is 833-99-TRUTH, or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org. That's 833-998-7884, or EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, 2KE0A1. Or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 
215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.